um, there is a lot, there are a lot of other um, sort of mitigating barriers like needing um, notary verification or um, even things that are more so related to voter registration. Um, so around um, needing to have um, somebody uh, a witness to co-sign your um, voter registration in, in other places. So um, for us, it was really important to sort of take the states from where they are and make recommendations based on that. And so um, we're able to move these states along the spectrum that brings them closer to sort of what we call the fullest expression of vote at home. Um, and so in some states, like I said, that looks like removing the excuse requirement. Um, that's that's really just like the base level of, of what we recommend and um, should really be um, in place in, in every state in the country at this point, um, because every state in the country has the capability to process um, mail ballots. How do we know this? Because absentee ballots are, are used all over the country um, for some level of voters, um, some percentage of voters. So this, the capacity at the base level is there in every state. And so it's merely enfranchising um, as many voters as possible into that system. Um, and so there are other um, pieces of that plan um, that are beyond sort of who gets mailed a ballot that are more so around removing barriers to a mail ballot. So um, we think about things like postage and making sure that um, really at, we would love at the federal level um, just to make sure that that enfranchisement is, is across the country. Um, but even if it's state by state, making sure that um, uh, voters are not having to basically pay a poll tax to be able to get their ballot um, back in the mail if that's um, how they would like to return it. Um, so covering that cost is is another piece of this and one of the various things that we speak to in, in our plan. Um, of course, uh, we also talk about um, in, in the more practical sense, what it looks like to sort of pool resources. And so in our plan, we really speak to what we call a localized option or a regionalized option, or sorry, uh, centralized option, uh, which or it can also be called regional and then a localized option. Um, we really advocate for the, the central or regionalized option wherein um, regions are able to pool their resources, things like sorters, which can, if, you, if you're in a small jurisdiction and um, you only have, you know, a, a few thousand voters or, um, you know, what, what we would consider small in terms of election and administration, um, and you're thinking, oh man, I'm getting all of these requests. How am I actually going to process this? Um, I, I don't have uh, an army of um, people to sort of help me literally open up all these paper ballot requests. Um, so then we think about resources, te technical resources like sorters um, that a lot of these states and local jurisdictions can invest in and be able to sort of use for the common good. Um, and this doesn't take away anything from local jurisdictions. You know, if there's one, um, you know, centralized sort or, or, or processing center, it, it still allows election officials to be able to call their own elections um, and have that sort of localized autonomy. You're just um, sharing the um, upfront cost and the um, labor in terms of the, the hardest parts of this process. And so um, what that also lends you is the opportunity for more transparency. Um, so when we're thinking about things like post-limiting audits, being able to do that in a more centralized way gives you so much more visibility into the process. Um, you can employ something like what um, they have in Orange County and in California, where you can have live streaming of um, poll processing, or sorry, um, ballot processing centers. You're able to um, have a lot more rigorous security in terms of who gets in and out, um, uh, what the background checks look like on, on the people that are able to access these ballots, um, formal training for people that do signature verifications. So you're not having to go to every small town and, and every state to be able to make sure that elections are being um, performed in a really secure and safe way. Um, so there are lots of um, these sort of accompanying practices that, that we advocate for that create uh, a healthy vote at home system. And, um, you know, I, I hate to be the person that says state by state, you know, every state is different, but it really is. You know, we, we're looking at states like Pennsylvania where um, there's some movement to enfranchise more voters um, into uh, vote, vote at home systems. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, some things were passed at the legislative level that don't necessarily reflect the reality of of election administration work. And so um, they're now having to sort of, sort of go back and correct a few of these things. Um, 
And a lot of that can be mitigated by on the front end, having access to these resources and um, really plugging election officials and legislators into um, the sort of wealth of knowledge that we've been able to um, sort of curate uh, over the years, as, as Phil said, from, from states like Oregon that have been at this um, for, for a while, but then also, you know, my home state of Colorado, where we have um, really the, the gold standard model of, of how all these things work together really well to be able to enfranchise the most voters possible. So that's, that's the sort of overview of our of our plan. And then um, on this, on the second side of how people can plug in, um, it, it really depends. There, there are lots of different pieces to this puzzle. Um, so as of late, um, what we're really seeing and, and what we anticipated to see um, is uh, really state action, state and local action. Um, I'll, all election work, in, in our opinion, uh, comes down to, to that local level, right? Like we're always thinking about the election official in the small jurisdiction who's just thinking about how to, you know, make the elections run for, for their community. And um, it, it's always coming down to that, you know, what happens at the federal level, we, we are actively involved in and, and will always um, advocate strongly for more access. Um, but now we're looking toward governors, we're looking toward state legislatures, um, who find themselves um, on, on recess or, or any variety of things um, in terms of trying or in special sessions to try and um, secure elections between now and November. And what we're really finding is, is the need for funding. Um, uh, and in the most recent stimulus package, uh, $400 million was allocated to election protection. And that is far below what really any expert organization has quoted. Um, most of us are really in the $1.2 billion range um, in terms of what we think election officials across the country will need to get this done. Um, and so when we're talking about what can happen at the state level, um, we're talking about governors, um, using their emergency powers to be able to secure funding um, for this. We're talking about, um, in some cases, philanthropic efforts to be able to fill this gap. Um, and, and we're really drilling it down that, that this is just what election officials need. And that's if, if nothing changes, election officials will need this money to be able to conduct secure elections um, during this time. Um, and while it might be helpful in the short term to kick to kick a primary election back to June, or um, we've even heard possibly July or August in some cases, um, it's, it, that's not a fix. That's not how you create um, an election system that works for the most voters. Um, and what we're finding that does is creates more confusion um, on the voter side, um, as well as on the voter education piece for advocates as well, because they are constantly um, offering changing information that erodes the ongoing trust that they've worked so hard to build with voters. So um, for us, we, we really stand in, in the urgency of all of this and, and really want um, any, any anybody who's thinking of advocating um, with us on this to really be able to speak to the urgency of what's, of what's going on. And in our plan, we um, set the date at, at really about April 15th. So a couple more weeks um, for state and local officials to really decide what they're going to do for November. Um, and some of that is just logistics, um, things as, as simple, but as big as ordering paper. Um, and some of those things are just to have your dates established and doable um, for whatever plan of action you decide to take for local elections. So um, for us, the, the urgency piece is really big, um, whether that's um, advocating for governors to take um, state action, uh, whether that's um, around funding in, in a variety of different ways. And then um, I really don't want to discount the um, the importance of voter voices in this as well. Um, I think particularly as um, conversations about vote at home are unfortunately becoming increasingly partisan, um, it's really uh, in a lot of ways going to come down to um, putting voters first and what what that means in, in practice, right? And so that's um, for us, we have built a pretty robust local op-ed program so that we can lift up some of those voices that, you know, aren't necessarily unfortunately going to be featured in a New York Times or Washington Post or USA Today um, and uh, really be able to, to lift them up in their own local um, sort of press arenas so that um, the people that are making decisions for um, let's say Maryland actually get to hear from Marylanders about um, what they want and, and what they need to be able to feel um, invested in this process. Um, 
because we know that the other side of that is a potentially historically low turnout where um, even fewer of the electorate um, sort of decides some of the, the biggest and most pressing needs um, of our country. So um, for us, in terms of other, other ways to plug in op-eds, um, uh, linking up with advocacy organizations around um, actions to press governors, um, and of course, social media. We can't have a conversation about what you can do without social media. Um, we are increasing our own digital capacity um, uh, really starting uh, toward the end of this week and into next week, um, just so we're able to disseminate some of uh, the information that lives on our website and in, and in other places um, so that people have access to this information, particularly around, you know, things like security and fraud. Um, you know, a, that's something that we get a lot, um, particularly from people that aren't familiar with the system and aren't familiar with um, various um, mitigating processes that really make fraud uh, a non-issue. The, the numbers are statistically um, so low in, in places like Colorado and in Oregon. And so really being able to get um, accurate and uh, distinct information um, on things like fraud, on things like equity. And so making sure that um, people know about the various processes, some of which I've talked about already in terms of tracking and curing, um, but also voter education so that um, people of different communities are able to um, be enfranchised in this process and don't get left um, by the wayside as we make this quite large change quite quickly. Um, and then of course, um, uh, when it comes to social media, just um, being able to amplify um, uh, some of the the media that's out there that we're putting out there um, to sort of lift the floor on this because what what we always sort of live in is the fact that you know for people like me I've only ever voted by mail um, just by virtue of living in Colorado but so many people um, have have no point of, of reference and I you know we would hate for their first point of reference to be um, you know dramatically partisan in, in one way or the other and not rooted in the fact and rooted in the process of, of how we um, get this done and how and how um, we bring this process to the voters and really center voters with vote by mail processes. Um, so I think those are sort of the main things in terms of the plan itself and ways that people can plug in. Um, we also have volunteer um, op uh, opportunities for people that are interested in tinkering with uh, research and with data and with numbers, um, because uh, as I said, research is a very big part of what we do. And so um, if anybody's interested in that, there are lots of different things I can plug you into. Um, and then of course the, the local op ed piece. So um, whether that's, uh, we, we have, um, uh, talking points and and local op-eds that that um, we can offer to people that are interested and who and who may not have the bandwidth to sort of produce their own media and then if people feel really strongly and, and have things that they want to to write or to submit um, we're happy to send those um, sort of through our channels and be able to use uh, our platform to lift up voter voices so that's that's very important to us Awesome. Thank you so much. I think I, I love um, the emphasis that you're putting on centering the voter and making sure that as many voters vote as can vote. Is that yeah. the right way to say it? Yeah. <laughs> as many of them have the opportunity to vote and are able to actually access that franchise, right? And then lifting up their voices through these op-eds and letters to the editor that you're talking about. I think that's super important. Um, I, I do wanna turn it over to allow um, folks who are listening to ask questions. Um, I, I do wanna ask real quick before we do that. Um, actually, if, if anybody has questions, you can either start typing them in the group chat um, or you can click on the manage participants button and your name should be at the very top. And then um, there's an option to raise your hand. So you can click more and then, oops, wait, where is it? It's usually there. Oh, where's the raise your hand button? It used to be under manage participants, but now I don't see it. Does yeah, anybody they, else see it? They just didn't update, so. Uh, oh man, maybe it's because of the update. <laughs> um, well, either, well then why don't, if, if you have a question, you can type it in to the chat or you can just put raise hand in the chat and then I can unmute you so that you can ask Lucille personally. Um, but while, while folks start thinking of questions, one thing that I wanted to ask is, um, you know, a lot of people, their, their state might already have absentee ballot option. 
Um, some states currently, they have an absentee ballot, but it's only, you know, you have to have a legitimate excuse. So what's the best way for people to figure out, you know, what, what the rules are in their state? Because I know a lot of people, they might not really even know. So is there a, a centralized resource? Do they need to go to their secretary of state? What do you guys recommend? Yeah, so um, there are a few things. Uh, obviously, the most sort of direct, but also often the most convoluted uh, way of doing that is going directly to your Secretary of State. That's um, where the most official um, sort of established version of all of your different options will live. Um, unfortunately, uh, I also have to tell you that sometimes stalking your Secretary of State or your local election official on Twitter, um, particularly with the most um, pressing updates and with things changing as quickly as they can um, can do, um, that is often a, a way to do that as well. I wish it wasn't, but it is. Um, and so for us, um, we tend to, just by virtue of, of having that really strong connection with election officials, we um, sort of tend to, to know about things through through those routes. But you know, as, as any given voter, I would say, um, definitely go to your Secretary of State's office. That will be the most official version of things. Um, that being said, there are lots and lots of um, voter directed um, organizations that will be able to offer some, some information on this. Um, one that we've uh, found recently that is quite helpful is wecanvote.us. Um, and so that is one that is um, made by one of our partners, the Center for Secure and Modern Elections. And so that's a place where you can kind of look up your state and figure out what some of your options are. Um, unfortunately, even with that, you know, if you live in a state like Nebraska, um, some of these things can vary quite widely um, by county. But um, that's, that'll be sort of your first port of call um, in terms of figuring out what you can do in your state, um, what's available and what you, what you need, and, and most importantly, what the dates are. Because um, unfortunately, a lot of those are moving based on when primary dates are being moved. Um, so that, that's unfortunately right now sort of the, the best way to do it. Um, and uh, I, I wish I had a better answer there. No, I think it's uh, that's understandable. Um, with so many things that have to do with elections, you're constantly having to say, well, it really depends on your state or it depends on your locality. Yeah. Every state is different. Um, that's, you know, one of the advantages and disadvantages of, of our federalist system here where everybody kind of is able to make their own rules. Um, so you kind of have to just check out, check out the local laws um, online. Yeah. So thank you. Absolutely. Um, we do have some questions coming into the chat. So Robin says, um, are there any states beyond the three you mentioned that are in the pipeline to have mail-in voting? Um, and I, I'm assuming that what you mean by having mail-in voting is um, moving to what we would say is a level five where um, most, if not all of the states are being mailed a ballot. Um, uh, and I say that because Technically, every state in the country has the ability to issue a voter um, a mail ballot. Now, there are restrictions based on who can request that and who is eligible for that based on state. And then somewhere in the middle there, there are a wide variety of states where you don't need an excuse, um, but that most people don't know that or don't have access to that or there isn't capacity to process um, what could amount to a majority of voters voting by mail. So. Um, I assume you mean the level five version and states that are moving there. So um, California was already well on its way. Um, they conducted, I believe it was 70% of um, jurisdiction, or sorry, counties in California were already mailing out um, all of their um, mailing ballots to all of their voters. Um, and they will most likely move to a full vote by mail, or uh, I said direct to voter um, mail ballot system. Um, there are states like um, Montana that are quite close to that. Um, so, um, or let's say Arizona, um, where again, lots of voters are, are using this already. They're requesting it. Um, there's um, another sort of tier that we call permanent absentee. So basically what that means is if you've requested to get an absentee ballot, you don't have to do it for every subsequent election. Um, so maybe that means, in, in some states, that means um, that you get a ballot sent to you for every election over the course of a year, and then you have to refile. Um, and in some states, that looks like um, getting a permanent ballot 
in general. So um, I should say mailed to you at every election. Um, so Arizona is one that is moving toward that. California is one. Montana is uh, there. Um, there's uh, pro some movement in terms of Maine. Um, and so in general, too, that you have to think about whether or not those states are moving um, to that model in the primary, if they're moving to that um, to for November, or if that's sort of a change that they're making in general, because we're also seeing um, states like Massachusetts um, make availability for that for special elections, but not necessarily for um, sort of regular process elections. Um, and so for that, you know, we, we really like to really stress the fact that that voters really like voting by mail where when they can they do um, so it, it's it'll be quite the challenge I think uh, for these states that are implementing um, the process of either mailing voters ballots or mailing requests directly to ballots which is not as good but um, sometimes you have to take what you can get um, that when voters have that experience and when they see how how um, convenient and accessible that is, uh, they rarely want to go back. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Hope that answered the question. Um, as, as I add on to that, it looks like Doug Goodman mentioned that um, uh, Nevada has a no excuse absentee ballot, um, but the Secretary of State has ordered uh, the June primary to all mail, and he says that all voters will automatically be mailed a ballot, and so he's hoping that there's going to be some good information from that following the primary. Um, I know that my home state, I'm, I'm in Colorado now too, but my home state of Ohio, um, they have decided to go for an all-mail all um, primary as well. I think that's going to be sometime here in April, I think. <laughs> oh, oh that up Phil, is, Phil is, is shaking his head no, so I'm sure he's oh. got something to say there. <laughs> uh oh, who is it? Sorry? Uh, Phil is, is shaking his oh, head. Oh, Phil. Okay. Here, here. Phil. Yeah, I'll unmute you. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's not. There, there we go. Oh, we had it for a okay. second. There we go. Okay. Uh, this is a very important distinction. Ohio is mailing out a notice to all its voters telling them how to apply. Yeah. for an absentee right. ballot. Oh and this goodness. is a fundamental Very common approach. misconception, unfortunately. It's, I would argue, more expensive. It's more yeah. confusing. It will not produce anywhere near the turnout impact. Mm. And I contrast that with what Doug mentioned about Nevada. And I want to add that Hawaii and Utah in 2020 will also be doing all vote-at-home elections. They just decided that a while ago. The challenge right now, and to follow up on what Lucille said, is virtually every state that holds a primary in the next two months is going to have a majority of its votes cast in the form of mailed out ballots. COVID-19 has made that inevitable. That's not a policy driven right. change. That's a worse pandemic and a century driven change. Mm -hmm. The real interesting question that we're seeing across the country is which states are going to stop in that kind of halfway point uh, which I would argue is the most confusing, most expensive, and uh, uh, in some ways more, most difficult, and just simply be flooded with applications. Come in every day, clerks have to turn them around, mm -hmm. people are confused about the rules, etc. versus which states will hold their primaries in the model that uh, the five regular states are, and now it looks like Nevada and, um, and Montana, they're going to leave it up to the counties to do it, and I think most of the counties will. But that's in real contrast to the states that are going to just simply encourage people to, 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 to do mail out ballots. And gotcha. most states are going to do that because the alternative is so awful. Uh, to ask people to risk their lives and health, to ask poll workers to do mm -hmm. that um, is, is, is a tough situation. And this is breaking news. This morning, the governor in Wisconsin said, we can't do it. I'm going to order the polls to shut. It got appealed to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and about an hour ago, the Wisconsin Supreme Court ordered that the election goes forward as ordered uh, before. So they'll have polls open tomorrow. So we have chaos across the landscape, and one of the things the National Vote at Home Institute is trying to do is bring a bit of order and rationality to a very chaotic situation right now. 
And yeah, that's the one thing that I would add there just a, a little bit before we head to the mm -hmm. next question. And I know we've got about 10 in there that we, we probably want to get to um, is really putting a, a finer point on what Phil was saying around the distinction between sending voters a notice to request. It's there's so many right. different barriers. And that's more so, you know, if anybody um, is familiar with um, like program management, um, the more hurdles you have people go through, um, the, the more areas that you're likely to lose people. So, you know, when, when we talk about mailing a, a ballot directly to the voter, that's the most expedient way to A, both notify them that it'll, an election is happening, B, give them the amount of time to consult their trusted sources, organizations, peers, family members, and then figure out their varied ways to return their ballots, as opposed right. to, again, having to have people go directly to their secretary of state, figure out when the election is, figure out when their ballots, um, when they can request a ballot, if they can request a ballot. Um, and so when we talk about, you know, what our ideal ecosystem is, um, that's why we really speak to mailing a, a ballot out to every voter and then having the varied ways to return because these sort of intervening in, intermediary um, steps really um, create defects in, in the system that are that just don't yield the results that you want. Um, so yeah, that's that's all I wanted to add there on that one. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I, most of my Facebook friends are from Ohio and I've been seeing some posts and even, I, I mean, I work for the Center for Election Science. This isn't our job. Vote by mail isn't our job. But I like to think I have a little bit of a handle on what's going on with elections. And even me, I got confused. So I can totally see how that would be really confusing for voters who, you know, are just trying to figure out how to access their ballot. Um, it would be nice if things were more consistent. Um, okay, so yeah, we've got lots of questions in here. Colin asks um, how, what the best way to follow up with you about helping out with research and numbers and possible content generation is. Um, if you've got a website or something, feel free to type that in too. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll, I'll pop this in the chat, but um, really the, the easiest way um, is to contact me and then our executive coordinator. She is our first port of call for, for our volunteers and sort of helping them um, get plugged into sort of the best tracks there. Um, and so I will leave um, those emails in the chat right now. Awesome. Thank you, Lucille. Um, Okay, next we have Paul Burke. He says that he believes vote at home is needed in November. Um, he says, I worry that signature verification when envelopes come in for checking has a big potential for voter suppression. You propose machines and bipartisan teams which can be appointed bipartisan officials. Is there validation of machine checking by race, age, sex, length of name? Um, so actually, uh, what we found is the best, and um, I'm sure Phil can uh, sort of speak a little bit to this as well, is um, actually having it be demographic blind in terms of the sorting. Um, because actually, uh, where we see a lot of um, voter voter suppression, voter disenfranchisement um, in the vote by mail process, um, or I should say, um, in in-person voting, is actually at the polling place. So um, that is the, the poll worker um, having their own either implicit bias or just human error involved with processing um, same-day registration. Um, that can be um, in terms of um, officiating um, ballots on the day of. And then, um, so when we talk about significant, sorry, signature verification, we're really talking about it being um, as impartial of a process as possible and um, uh, appointing bipartisan teams. Um, a ballot is only ever thrown out if both of those people um, um, uh, see that there's a see that there's a discrepancy and, and vote for it to be out. So um, while yes, there is um, th those people are um, appointed. There's still that that sort of fail safe there. Um, and it's by no means 100%. But what we do know is that um, the majority of the sort of voter suppression, voter disenfranchisement that happens in the polling place um, is due to either um, bias in poll workers or um, just human error. So um, the more we can invite um, scrutiny and um, review and double checking both um, by uh, electronically and um, through bipartisan actors, uh, the more accountability there is so that it's not just up to these one-on-one -on -one interactions with people um, who may or may not um, have the best interests of the voter at heart. So um, that's definitely one of those measures. And then um, there, there are other mitigating factors. I mean, we talked about um, 
tracking and, and things like that. So um, there, there are ways to sort of better get at and better address um, some of these uh, concerns in terms of, of signature verification, um, especially when we know what the alternative is. Gotcha. Um, Phil, did you have anything to add? Uh, just, uh, I, I just Lucille's absolutely right to keep it blind. That's what we've done in Oregon all along. Other states haven't done that. Georgia was a real uh, offender about uh, doing that. Um, you know, a lot of voters' signatures change. Uh, even I've got kids in their 20s. They've kind of, they're still working out what their signature is going to be. It is important that they match, though, and it's important to have that validation. Uh, those who, who have been trying to suppress the vote, would, would use the lack of signature verification to completely try to discredit this system, even though it is more secure, it's uh, more reliable if you have to do a recount when you have paper ballots rather than machine generated and software enabled machines. Uh, so I would urge people as they work on this issue to uh, try to fix those signature problems um, and not succumb to some who say, well, it, it's just a, a bad idea. It's actually an essential part of ensuring the integrity of, of this uh, approach to voting. And um, also it's, it's uh, a particularly good process when coupled with curing, um, particularly direct to voter yes. curing. Um, so, you know, um, I think particularly of a, of a coworker of, of ours, um, Audrey Klein, who was initially um, going to be on this webinar, um, she had, um, her mother had Parkinson's and her signature changed. Uh, to right. that. And so um, that's the sort of thing where um, it, it might come up as an inconsistent signature, but then that's one where you can go directly to your voter, say, is this you? Um, and then that voter can actively participate and know and feel really enfranchised in the process of saying, yes, that's me or no, that's not. Um, so uh, again, it just kind of points to um, when it's done well, there are, uh, there are multiple checks and balances in the system um, to better mitigate this. And all of those checks and balances um, amount to more security, more verification, more enfranchisement than the simple um, interactions with one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one poll workers. That's super helpful. Thank you. Um, I hadn't even thought about, you know, uh, Robin mentioned in the chat, you know, somebody having a stroke, you mentioned Parkinson's. I hadn't really thought that much about that. Um, so it's nice to know that there are uh, ways that you can, you can mitigate that and steps you can put in place. Um, okay, then we've got Ryan. He says he's curious if Oregon, Washington, or Colorado use public service announcements to educate voters on the process on the processes used in vote by mail. What questions did voters have when the switch to vote by mail occurred in those states? Yes, so actually, um, and that's something that we haven't gotten to talk too much um, yet. So thank you so much for that question. Um, really uh, robust voter education campaigns are um, sort of what we love to see and what we really encourage and is, is a, a pretty hallmark part of our strategic plan in terms of what we have to see um, for um, secure accessible elections um, in primaries and going into November. Um, and so what we've what we found is the simple act of mailing the voter a ballot is a very, very, very good tool. And, and a lot of things can be integrated um, into that and directly to the voter along with the ballot in terms of education. So, um, you know, here in Colorado, you receive your ballot, you receive instructions about how to fill it out, you receive information about um, all of your local polling centers um, and all the information that you need um, for any sort of mitigating factors like, um, uh, you know, things that being weird with your ballot, if you um, need to vote a provisional ballot, et cetera. So um, that's, that's sort of the gold standard is when you're sending a voter a ballot, that's a perfect opportunity to give them a ton of really supportive um, education materials. That being said, um, uh, Denver, but also um, a, a bunch of jurisdictions, I'm gonna particularly pick out Orange County in California, um, have employed a really robust education campaign for voters. Um, just to sort of get them used to all of the, the different sort of pieces there, right? So that whether that's dates, whether that's um, what's available to them in terms of um, modes to return, um, what to do in, in, in terms of uh, needing contingencies, uh, which we do find though that um, provisional ballots um, go down to very, very, very low numbers in states um, 
where voted home is is um, used quite widely. Um, so you tend to not need as much when you do it well in the first place. But um, all of that aside, uh, you, whenever you have a voting system, even when you're sending ballots directly to the voter, there's a huge voter education piece um, that election officials uh, really should take on um, if, they're, if they're doing it um, well. And I think a, a lot of that challenge doesn't come necessarily for larger jurisdictions like say in Orange County, but um, do, definitely that that um, gap shows itself the most in smaller jurisdictions. And so one of the things that we do at Vote at Home is, um, and we're in the process of um, sort of repackaging this for election officials today, um, but making sure that they have access to um, lots of these sort of starter voter education pieces that they can use and adapt and push out so that voters um, can really get um, as much education as possible around um, what process are what processes are available to them. Um, but what I will say though, is without any kind of voter education, without any kind of official pushes, even with all the different um, changes, you have um, multiple magnitudes of increased requests of absentee ballots across the country. So regardless of whether or not there's um, a robust education system, voters are asking for this. And so the voter education system is what you layer on top of that to make sure that all voters have access to the information that they need, um, not just the voters that are particularly tuned into the news cycle or who um, have done it before or are familiar with it. So, um, you know, again, the gold standard is sending everybody a ballot and you're able to sort of package all that information together. Um, but in some of these states where, you know, we're not gonna go the full way um, by November, unfortunately, it's, it's really going to be about the voter education piece and how we layer that on top of um, the various things that happen that are happening. That being said, it's really hard to start thinking about your voter education when you're still having fights at the leadership level about what you're going to do with your election as a whole. So um, that's sort of like a, a tier two version of, of these issues. And um, what I will say um, in terms of of education as well is um, we we have these states that are um, conducting uh, primaries right now um, and we're not talking about them and the reason why we're not talking about them is because they're doing it by vote by mail and they're having significantly lower issues um, than these states that are having to um, dramatically enfranchise voters because they don't um, because of previous reliance on in-person voting um, which we know cuts out lots of people um, across different communities whether that's um, you know, various ethnic groups, whether that's people who are um, uh, more, more rural voters, um, people who are shift workers, people who um, aren't able to afford childcare um, for the amount of time that they might be staying in a line. So um, yeah, when, we, when we're thinking about um, sort of what, what's possible there in terms of voter education, um, you need more education the less well you do it in the front end, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And what you said about sending the voter education with the ballot, if you're doing it that way, if you're doing the all in package, that totally makes sense because you're sending everybody their ballot and then you know that they're going to see that voter education at the same time. Um, but if they're doing it kind of piecemeal, it makes it a little bit more difficult, right? Absolutely. Um, and then we just got a, a comment in um, from TS um, who asked, could we use Trump's declaration of emergency to force universal mail-in voting on health grounds? <laughs> well, I don't think you'd <laughs> ever want to go there. <laughs> there's, a, there's a chuckle. Um, so logistically, uh, theoretically, that is a possibility. Um, when we're thinking about what's probable, um, we're really uh, thinking about governors and um, governors' abilities to use emergency declarations to make things happen at the state level. Um, and particularly when we think about national things, um, we, we, as a, for our organization, we think a lot about funding and we think a lot about um, removing some of the barriers in the ecosystem like prepaid postage. So um, those are the things that we think are most likely, most plausible um, to be able to move in a big way, um, uh, especially seeing um, some of the movement around um, some of the economic measures in states um, corresponding to um, various party lines, unfortunately, rather than um, directions from the health community. Um, 
it's, it's just unlikely to see that sort of national change based on that. Um, but uh, when one tidbit that I will like to tell you is that uh, the president and the first lady have requested their absentee ballots from the, the great state of Florida. So um, if, if that tells you anything at all. That's helpful. Um, and actually, because you were talking about going to governors rather than trying to, you know, force it on a national level. Um, and Robin actually asked whether the, your organization, National Vote at Home Institute, has spoken directly to governors. Yes, yeah, so we have uh, spoken directly to nearly if not all governors in, in the country at this point to talk about um, what their options are at this stage. Um, and to give some of them credit, some of them have come to us um, uh, just from being in the space for so long um, to sort of get, get our lay of the land of what's possible. And so um, uh, that's definitely something that, that we're plugged into um, because I, I think there are a lot of governors across the country that um, are really, um, taking this this very seriously um, and are very much invested in what their their duties are what their roles are in terms of securing the the health and livelihood and the civic rights of the of the people in their states and so um, I think every I think every governor in the country is at least thinking about it how much you know will there is there um, to actually get it done um, how how much um, hesitance there is around the process of getting it done um, Though they're, you know, in terms of resources as well, you know, if you're looking at a project that you've never considered before, um, thinking about how to do it and making sure that you're not breaking something while you're fixing it um, is, is obviously a valid concern. And so for us, um, it's really important to sort of be that, be that mitigator to say, hey, this is, this is a process oriented um, uh, innovation that you can make. This is a bipartisan um, route that you can take. Um, this is a route that election officials and election administrators stand by and would like to be able to do um, should the resources be made available. Um, and here is how you can do it. And here's what they need. So um, yeah, those are definitely conversations that are happening. Can you guys hear me? Your seal is frozen for me, but it might be my internet. Oh, you can hear me, Phil? Okay, yes. maybe maybe it's Lucille then. Uh-oh. Oh, hi. Oh, now you're back. You're back. Hi. Hey. <laughs> that's what happened. That's, that's the now joy. I don't know where I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> that's the joy of working with the internet, right? I love it. Um, yeah, I, I think you were, it, it sounded like you were kind of wrapping up about um, just going to the governors, making sure that they have all of the tools and information they need. And that's kind of how, how you all view your, your role at Vote at Home is to just make sure that they have as much information as they need um, and identifying ways that you can mitigate any, you know, issues that they might be having, right? For sure. Okay. Um, all right, and then I, I think the, you may have already answered this, but just to make sure, um, Jessica asks what the best way for her to get started on some of the voter voice action items like op-eds, educating the public um, is. And so she should just email um, either you or Allie, correct? Yes, so okay. um, preferably both of us so that if okay. one gets the email, the other one will catch it. Um, but yeah, so that's that's the best way. And then we'll um, get you connected with um, sort of our, our press team so that we can get you connected with um, uh, sort of what, what you or some of your fellow advocates might need on this. Um, identify, you know, um, where you live and, and uh, where um, your voice might be most effective and then um, hopefully get you in, in front of as, as many people as possible. Um, and so, you know, depending on what your affiliations are and, and all those things, really being able to sort of um, ho hopefully uh, plug you in and, and be able to lift your voice. And because like I said, um, you know, our, our um, place in this ecosystem tends to be uh, really much in the, in the space of knowing how these things work and making really strong um, expert recommendations. But um, again, we, we really want to make sure that this, this whole effort is rooted in, in voter experiences and um, making sure that, that those voices are being heard through all of this, especially as um, things uh, become increasingly more partisan. And um, unfortunately, we might um, 
we anticipate seeing a lot more misinformation about the process out there. And so really being able to keep this as much as we can in, in the arena of research and effects and um, really being able to lift up the voter experience and, and give voters what their access to their right to vote. Absolutely. Um, okay, I think I, there's just one more question. If any, I'm just going to give a last call because I know we're right, uh, we're past the hour now. Um, so if anybody else has any questions, please go ahead and stick them in there so we can get them answered for you. Um, but we have one more question from Colin. He asked, what is the recommended time period between when ballots are sent out and the last day they can be received? Oh, um, this might be a better question for Phil because I know that this varies greatly um, across the country and has to do with um, sort of the, the local um, uh, sort of requirements and then there's what's accepted nationally. So I'm gonna kick this one to Phil. <laughs> yeah, it's usually we recommend at least two weeks and uh, maybe as much as four. Uh, uh, you'll also have military ballots that have to go out even sooner. Uh, federal law uh, affects those kind of separately. and They get them up sometimes 45 or 60 days out. But um, I think as we mentioned earlier, some states count the ballot, but it has to be in by election day. Some states actually even say it has to be in the day before. Uh, other states allow a postmark. And um, we're recommending that uh, most states move to a postmark, that states move to a postmark uh, time. And uh, the postal service has gotten a lot better tracking mail than when we started doing it in Oregon 20 years ago. We've worked with them. They've been a great partner. Um, concerns that people do have about mail getting delivered in either direction. I, I think it, it's not totally perfect, but they've done, a, a, I think, a pretty remarkable job and know that they're in the spotlight right now with what's happening. Uh, if there's any organization in America that knows it needs to perform very well um, uh, in the public eye, I think it'll be the Postal Service in this upcoming election. So the uh, uh, so you want to get it, people a couple of weeks to have the ballot in their hands before they actually have to get it back. And the one thing I would add there too is um, our, our recommendation is, is postmark um, and uh, that's postmarked by election day. Um, but what we also, the sort of asterisk that we, that we add there is then we also have to be patient for actual processing, right? Yeah. So, you know, when we're you know, looking at, at things like Super Tuesday and, and everybody's calling states based on exit polls and all this, all this stuff and everybody sort of wants that, that really immediate um, sort of, of call for this. Um, definitely, we, we can see that, that voting by mail extends that. Um, but also, um, when you are able to process ballots, so this is another, again, like um, case of what, what is the best ecosystem and how can we facilitate the best ecosystem we do accept by postmark, but you're also um, in an ideal system giving election officials um, up to you know anywhere between a couple of days to two weeks before the election to start processing those ballots. So um, you know take uh, Jefferson County here in Colorado, they you know do a vote by mail system. Uh, they do early processing, and so they're able to um, really to basically track returns in real time. Um, and so you're not actually seeing those delays um, that we see in some of these places where um, you know you get all these mail ballots and they basically have to sit somewhere um, safe and locked up and secure until you're able to. Um, actually start processing them, right? And so um, then you're processing all the in-person ballots and then somebody calls something on the in-person ballots and then people sort of try and act like the, the mail ballots aren't there. And in states or, or jurisdictions like DC where only 5% of, of voters uh, roughly are uh, turning in uh, mail ballots, you know, that might be statistically negligible, but nobody wants to hear that their ballot is statistically negligible, right? And so we really wanna make sure that we are preserving um, the, the sort of media landscape as well for these states that don't have the early processing but do have mail ballots um, to make sure that we are waiting for all those ballots to come in and that we all have a consensus around um, those ballots mattering, right? Um, so that's, that's the one asterisk that I would add to that in terms of postmark. 
Gotcha. There's so much to think about. So much to think about. I'm glad that you guys are here to help us through it. Um, Emily has a really interesting question and I've seen this posed in kind of different frames. Um, but the way she asks it is, what do you say to people who oppose votes, vote from home due to concerns about women in abusive relationships being able to vote for themselves? Um, and as I mentioned, I've seen people kind of have a similar concern about um, folks who may have a certain type of disability or they may be older and maybe, um, you know, younger people in their household are somehow forcing them to vote a certain way. So um, what's your response to, to those concerns? Yeah, so um, I think in that question, we're, we're talking about a few different groups. And so I, I would really hesitate to group them together. Um, so the first one, speaking about people um, in abusive households. Um, so what having an extended voting period with, and um, mailing uh, ballots directly to voters allows you to do if you're in that scenario and you're um, uh, receiving, unfortunately, um, violence um, or, or coercion, um, is that you are able to um, actually have access to a polling place outside of the ballot that you get mailed if you feel that you need to um, have have that um, different option. So it's it's definitely not locking voters into only voting the ballot that comes to them um, in the mail. And because of um, specific barcodes, there you're also um, taking out the possibility that somebody's going to vote twice on the same ballot. Um, so those things are pretty well tracked, both um, from by election officials, but also through USPS, um, through barcoding and and um, unique signaling on the ballot itself. So. Um, if, if I am sort of the, if, if I'm experiencing coercion, I have various other ways in order to cast that ballot. So I'm not um, sort of restricted to um, uh, an in-person at home pressure situation. That being said, the alternative for, uh, for a lot of these folks um, can often be voting in person, which, um, uh, and I should say only voting in person, um, which can also sort of pose its own um, challenges for, for people that are in abusive relationships, um, not being able to leave, experiencing lots of pressure at the polling booth. And so what um, mailed ballots, mailed out ballots are, uh, allow those people to do is um, find different ways to cast their ballot that are outside of the home um, and really anywhere. So that could be um, at the home of a, of a trusted um, third party. It can be um, in a car that um, you, know, you drop off or it can be going to an in-person polling station, uh, sorry, not polling station, vote center um, and voting in person rather than um, voting with a mail ballot at home. So there are various options there. Um, so we talked about people um, experiencing abuse, but also people with disability. So people with disability are one of the um, groups that we specifically advocate for um, in-person voting options. And so um, like uh, Phil and I spoke to earlier, um, when we talk about you know, full vote by mail, um, we're not just talking about mailing every voter a ballot. We're also talking about um, leaving the full spectrum of ballot return. And so for some people, that does look like um, going to a polling place, particularly people with specific physical disabilities. And so those folks will likely go into a, a polling place in person and um, either receive physical aid or be able to use um, electronic um, voting aids that are able to um, sort of help them in the process rather than um, making them rely on a paper ballot. Um, same with elderly folks. Um, a, a lot of the time uh, what we see with elderly folks, particularly like say if they live in a nursing home, is those ballots will be, um, particularly I can speak to what happened in Colorado, those ballots are actually hand delivered um, by um, sort of, um, I forget exactly what the term is, and I'm going to call them agents of the government, which seems very nefarious, but <laughs> they're designated people. Um, so not just like, you know, a random person. Um, and so they get um, delivered um, in a very deliberate and so um, specific way. That's the same for um, a bunch of people, any case where there's um, a, a large group of people that live under the same physical address. Um, and uh, so that's a, a way that those people are able to specifically get their ballots, specifically um, make sure that they're being enfranchised. Um, that being said, um, fraud in a in a variety of of ways, and that's one version. But there, you know, others um, tends to be remarkably low in vote at home systems because of some of the other mitigating factors um, that we've talked about before. Not to um, 
sort of uh, beat it over the head. Um, but there are lots of um, coordinating aspects that, that let you um, uh, sort of mitigate that. And really giving people a longer period and more options uh, gives them more abilities to sort of escape negative situations and cast their vote um, in one of those other ways. I hope that answered the question. I think, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's helpful to see how having multiple choices, multiple modes of voting can really help to enfranchise voters because all of us have so many different needs, so many different situations in life. Um, and it, it seems to make sense that that means that we need multiple ways to be able to cast our vote, right? Yeah, um, I know Phil is here in the, in the comment section too. So I'm happy to take on anything that he hasn't necessarily spoken to specifically. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't see that. So it looks like... Yeah, I wanted to address some of the things that, that, that people have asked for, because uh, if in case we run out of time, and want to sure. emphasize, of too, course. that uh, we're available to just directly, you know, contact us if people have any, any other questions. Um, uh, um, you know, a couple people have, have asked, uh, you know, about canceling ballots. Um, mm -hmm. That's tough, if you put your ballot in, you can't be getting in a situation you're letting people come and 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 uh say gee i, I want it back uh, mm -hmm. so we tell people wait don't go too early a lot of people in this presidential primary just voted way earlier than they needed to it's why the postmark is important you don't have to worry about whether it gets received by you can wait until election day just put it in a in a, in a mailbox and you know the uh uh you know, the assumption and it's a couple of questions about pushing for Congress to mandate vote, voting at mail on all the states. And again, when we say mandate voting by mail, uh, I do not see Congress ever saying that all 50 states need to automatically mail everybody their ballots. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe down the road. But for now, the single most important thing Congress could probably do is just simply say in a federal election, we'll pay the postage. Uh, take that issue off the table. It's uh, states and local governments are now having to pay for it. Um, it's an impediment. Uh, you know, my own kids, they're in their 20s. They often don't have stamps. Uh, so um, simple things that, that, that can be done uh, to, to further this along and, uh, and not overreach. We're at a time right now that, that people have to be careful not to use the pandemic itself as trying to get a lot of other things that or might be good election policy, but aren't central to actually holding an election uh, at, at, at the moment. And the final thing I wanted to emphasize is there is no perfect election system. There will always be problems and glitches. But what is important is that there's transparency and the ability to, to see it. And Lucille's made some great points about the importance of audits to be able to look back and assure people that the counting machines are working. Um, uh, uh, I think in, in an election that already was slated to be one of the most contested and polarizing in my lifetime, and I'm in my mid-60s, um, that having paper ballots at the end of the day, and a lot more than we expected to have because of what's happened, is one of the best protections we have about people losing, protesting the results, and not accepting them. There still may be some of that, but uh, I think this is a method that really will help minimize that. But we do have to uh, work to try to get as best systems and processes in place. And we'd love everybody's help who's on this call to, uh, to be, uh, uh, be advocates for us in, in all the right places. So. Yeah, and um, just to, to do a super quick whip around on a couple of the, the last minute messages before we close. Um, uh, it looks like Colin was asking about um, things like candidates dropping out of the race and um, accused of crime or scandal. Or scandal. Um, so in a lot of states, um, what ends up being best is running this uh, in parallel with ranked choice voting, uh, which sort of uh, negates this, this issue. Um, Phil also spoke to the fact that while you have um, an extended period to return your ballot, it does not necessarily mean that you have to return your ballot right when you get it. So that's also um, a thing there. Um, this also tends to really be an issue with primaries like the primary that, that we had this year um, on the Democratic side, where there is an extremely um, wide field and also 
the primary season is extremely long. Um, so while that is not common, it is obviously a thing that we've observed, and those are a couple of, of mitigating factors. Somebody asked about um, death of, of a voter, and so usually what happens um, is that um, all ballots are um, uh, read against the the death registry so um it's there are actually very robust ways that that states and lo local jurisdictions keep track of who dies and so that's what's um gets uh mapped against the the voter files and and usually um uh things like that um and the same can be employed with uh voter registration as well so while voter registration is not directly related to mailing everybody a ballot it is obviously part of the ecosystem like i said before and so um, a lot of states will use um various second party um uh information that they for that they already keep for um people updating their addresses and that's um one of the issue one of the mitigating things that we really recommend, um, particularly for voters um, of different minority groups that are that have a higher um, percentage rate of changing addresses. So um, not necessarily relying on the voter to come and say, hi, I changed my ballot, I need, or I changed my address, I need another thing. Um, but as they're doing these other processes and changing changing their addresses there, making sure that those things are, are, are um, either automatically updated or that they trigger um, a, an electronic sort of kickback where then the Secretary of State can say, hi, you're, we have seen through, you know, whatever other system we're using that you might have changed your address. Is that correct? Um, so that's one of the other mitigating factors. Um, Phil already spoke to Congress and then um, I think I I think I got everybody. Hopefully, I'm sorry if I did not. Please send me an email with your question if I didn't. <laughs> I, th I think you got everybody, but I know that Colin did ask earlier, hey, I have a million questions. I could go all night. I know this is super interesting for a lot of people listening. So if they have lots more questions, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you all? Um, or who, who should they get in contact with at Vote at Home? Yeah, so um, if it's more of a general question around um, how Vote at Home works, or maybe um, in terms of like wanting to access a number or research, um, I would say the first port of call is to go to www.voteathome.org. That's our website. I will drop it here. Um, and at the top right um, of the homepage, there's a link called the Reference Library. Um, and so that has a lot of our latest um, sort of research and findings um, all in one place, um, as well as resources um, for, for a lot of these things. Um, our strategic plan and other things are in there as well, um, if you want to uh, have some nice bedtime reading. Um, and so if it's more of a general question, I would recommend emailing that to info at Vote at Home. Um, that I'll drop that in here, info at voteathome.org. You will um, be met with our um, amazing director of research, Jerry Langler, and he um, is a wealth of knowledge. Um, and then um, anything related to specifically plugging in or getting involved, um, that would be um, me or Allie. Um, and I dropped our emails in there before. I just type in those in again, just so that people have them just in case, because I know it can be a pain to scroll back through the chat. Um, well, if nobody has any other questions, I just want to thank both of you, Lucille and Phil, for being on this call. I really, really appreciate it. It's been super informative and interesting. Um, I was so interested at the beginning that I just jumped in. I didn't even say who I am or what my organization is, so I should probably put in a, a quick plug. My name is Caitlin Alley Pena. I'm the Director of Operations and Programs for the Center for Election Science. Uh, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit that um, studies and advocates for better voting methods. So when we're talking about voting methods, we're not talking about the, the mode, so mail-in or um, electronic or in-person. We're talking about the actual um, information you're able to provide on your ballot. So what we advocate for is something called approval voting. It allows you to vote for as many candidates as you like. So if you like three candidates, you can vote for all three, and then the candidate with the most votes wins. Um, last year, we helped Fargo, North Dakota become the first city in the U.S. to implement approval voting, and now we're working with some activists in St. Louis um, so that they can get it implemented for their city elections. So if anybody's interested in learning more about that and learning about our work, you can find us at electionscience.org. Um, 
And we're also hosting, we're trying to host a lot more of these events because I know that people are stuck at home right now. Um, they're trying to find content, they're trying to interact with others. So we're trying to host these virtual events to help inform people and keep them engaged. Um, and so we have more coming up if folks are interested in RSVP and taking a look at those. So I'll stick that link um, in the chat as well. It's electionscience.org slash take that dash action slash events. Um, but thank you again to Liz, Lucille and Phil. You guys are doing such important work at Vote, Vote at Home. Um, I hope everybody goes and checks out your website um, and learns more about how they can get involved. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank thanks everyone and hope to hear from somebody else soon. Yeah, thanks everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>